this course and class is about this introduction, or, or mainly it's, it's called Quranic studies. It uh, looks and discusses uh, the holy book of Muslim, which is called in Arabic language, Quran. But uh, when we write it in English, we say Quran. So uh, the, the, the correct form of writing it in our English uh, transcribing is Q U R A N, but uh, for some reasons, Quran we do have it as Quran in our course. But if you need, if you look at the correct transliteration, it is Q U R A N Quran. <clears throat> uh, so, <clears throat> so what is the Quran? So that's the question, probably. As mentioned, uh, Quran is the uh, sacred book of Islamic religion. It's a book that Muslims believe that it was revealed to Muhammad, the prophet, in around seven centuries, like 648, no, I mean 610. So, <clears throat> When Muhammad was prophet, or was, according to Islamic sources, chose to be prophet by God, there were messages coming through uh, from God through Gabriel, an, a, an angel, to him, and bringing him the message of God during the course of 23 years. And... <clears throat> After those 23 years, Muslim had a collection of revelation, which later called Quran or Quran in their, in their language, in Arabic language. <clears throat> so those messages uh, that Muhammad received during his prophecy uh, include many, many different topics. It's from ethics, moral, inviting pe people to monotheism, uh, warning them, avoiding them from doing bad deeds, or inviting them to do good, good. So, and then uh, letting them know about the purpose of life based on what God tells him. And more importantly, the relation between human and God, and also the future of human, I mean, the, the life after death, which, is, uh, which includes the, many, the most important part of many religions. So basically, Quran included a divine message, which was uh, uh, common among all divine religions, whether it's discussion about God, the origin, which is God. It's discussion about creation, or who is creator. It's discussion about the uh, attributes of God. So when he, when he talks about God, it needs to tell the reader who that God, God is or what's, what are the qualities of God. <clears throat> so... Uh, this is another discussion. Plus that, it talks about human, his life, purpose of life, making a society, how to live in a society, what's the relationship between you and other people, what's the relationship between you and animals, what's the relationship between you and nature, and whatever else. And plus this, as I mentioned before, you have the idea of future. And uh, so what happens after death? If, is there any life after death? What happens to your death? How, how you will be dealt? Or what you, will you be encountered after this life? So what is here after at all? Or even more questions. How you will be resurrected? Is this your, do you, start your new life after this with this physical body or no it's not at all 
you will have a new shape, a new body, new metaphysical body. Okay? Quran, when, uh, in this book, when it talks about God, uh, talks about him telling you or the, the reader that this God is God of the two world. Meaning to say that the world of visible, visible, or visible, I'm sorry, visible world or invisible world, or according to a philosophical language, uh, the world of material, but the world of physics, the world of metaphysics, and what uh, all those things. So, <clears throat> and uh, as I mentioned, the question was that whether when you are going to have a life after this life. How do you transform from this being, which is a physical being, material being, corporeal being, to an uncorporeal being? In Islamic language, these two worlds, the world that we are here inside it, is called Alam al-Shahada, the world, the divisible and seen world. And the other world, and the other word is also called Alamul Aib, which means the invisible, the unseen, the spiritual, the metaphysical world. So that was a question, and then it was sort of answered in this a scripture. How do you, you know, face the other world? How do you how you will appear there? Is it uh, logical to say that when you go to that world again, you have this the same body? And then the question is that how come do you go there? Well, while it's on the world of unseen or the world of a spiritual, what 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 will you do with your physical body there? Why do you need this body? Because you know, imagine if uh, everything else than you has another shape or a spiritual shape then why you need this body so all those questions i was trying to say that are this constant quran and uh, again later on in islamic history and in the history of islamic thought many 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 people discussed it and discussed it and uh, there, there were many many schools of thought uh, explaining all those questions. So not all of them the same. They had different views and those different views lived together and all together uh, they uh, established um, a big cultural or a big civilization or, or a school of thought which has its own branches within, but it is called it was called Islamic civilization or Islamic thought or uh, yeah Islamic thought and civilization or whatever or Islamic philosophy. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, w when we talk about Quran in the way that we say that okay, this book is sacred. That the reason for sacredness of the Quran is that it was revealed by God and revelation by God means that it has an origin which is, comes from the divine sources. Whatever, whatever comes from the divine sources, whatever which is not material, not physical, not from the, the world that we see it, in the language of religion, is sort of call, called sacred. So the sacredness is again uh, um, the reason for sacredness of the book is that okay, it comes from the divine source, uh, <clears throat> and that uh, makes it holy for Muslim. So making it holy, then there are consequences. When in the Islamic civilization, Muslims uh, try to talk or to discuss about any issues, any subjects, whether it is about a 
personal, about creation, about God, about the human relationships, you know, about the community, about the face, whatever they had to do, they had to refer back to Quran. Say, finding any, any sort of, um, uh, any sort of idea that was discussed in Quran, even two words, you know, imagine if they are during the Islamic civilization, if they were going to talk or to decide about, okay, how to do very tiny, special, small thing, they had or they needed to go back and find if there is a view on that thing in the Quran or not. And then the problem is, or, or some people were coming to, to saying that, okay, the way Quran suggests us to do this is such and such, but there were other people that saying that, no, you're wrong, or we think that, no, maybe there is another option for that. And doing that, such X things could be done in another way. So because of all those disagreements or, you know, different understanding and interpretation of the Quran, you will have different schools of thought in Islamic civilization. Like what you had uh, in among the, you know, other religions. I mean, you have like in Christianity, you have Catholicism, you have Protestantism, you have Orthodoxism or Orthodox Christianity. And then Orthodoxism, or, or Orthodox has different, uh, you know, branches. Um, so same goes on with the Islamic, uh, with the Islamic uh, revelation and civilization after that. But our discussion as well will cover um, kind of comparative studies with the other religion, Quran, with Bible, and, and Old Testament. But mainly why? Uh, the question is why? Why when we discuss about Quran, we need to discuss also about the Bible? Why do we need to discuss about Christianity, Judaism, probably Zoroastrianism and other religions? The point is that the place Quran was revealed to Muhammad, uh, I mean Mecca, the city within the Arabia in the seventh century, so the city itself had really a special history that I hope in some point, at some point, I go back and talk a little bit about that city. But the point is that they were grouped, uh, you know, different tribes. Christians, idol worshippers, Jews, you know, many other kind of, very different kinds of people and beliefs. So as a new re revelation, Quran talks to different tribes, to different peoples, you see? So the point is that sometimes Quran talks about Christianity and about Judaism as a religion, but sometimes it talks about Jewish people and Jewish tribes within that ge geography and that specific time, and also talks about Christian people, that they were living in that area, okay? So one needs to distinguish between discussion about, discussion of Quran about Christianity and discussion of Quran about Christian people or Christian tribes that they were living around Muhammad by the time of revelation. So that's why we also cover those discussions in our class, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mentioned the, the, the rottenness of Quran. 
yeah. And again, when we talk about revelation, I mean, we say that, okay, God sent his message to Muhammad as his prophet. Then the question is that how, technically how it, uh, how it happened. Uh, the point is that uh, according to Islamic sources and, or, and also according to Quran itself, it says that the Gabriel, the angel, which is no, yes, this Gabriel for every any in any religion, he is the uh, carrier of the message of God to the prophets. Okay, so at the same, so same again. Uh, he brings the message to Muhammad. The point is that Muhammad, living in a tribe that most of them, or majority, were idol worshippers. And then he, probably, he is not following their rules. For this end, and for that reason, he goes for seclusion. He goes for, um, you know, to do, to have his own kind of seclusion and prayers. He goes to a mountain nearby the city of Mecca, and then there is a cave. He goes there, he prays there. And in one of those prayers that is that the message comes to him. Gabriel comes and, you know, he, he first he doesn't know what, what, what is happening. Who, who is this guy, what, what he says. And the very first, the very first, uh, 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 a very first sentence that Gabriel talks to him is that read, you know, Iqra in Arabic and says read. And then Muhammad says that what? What should I read? I don't know. I'm sort of, you know, I don't know how to read. And then he says that Iqra in Arabic read, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq read in the name of the God who created you. And then probably he repeats, and then a sort of revelation comes to Muhammad at that very first moment in 610. And that's the beginning of many other revelations that comes in 23 years to him from God. Sometimes it comes like, a chapter sometimes it comes like like two sentences you know so uh, not always Muhammad you know he was receiving according to Quran and according to Islamic sources he was receiving that revelation but it was not always to say that okay every time he was receiving that kilobyte or megabyte of data from God there was, it was the variation of those amount, amount of things. As such, uh, God calls Muhammad in, in, in his revelation as his prophet and as his messenger in Arabic. Uh, the, the word is used as Rasul, Rasala, Rasul, and Nabi, Nabi is the one who informs others about the message, and the Rasul is the one who carries a message to the other people. And also, Muhammad was called as warner, or a barrier of good tidings. In Arabic, Bashir wa Nadir. So the one who gives good, gives good news to you about Okay, if you do such and such good things and believe and have faith and follow the rules of God, so you will face, you will encounter paradise, otherwise you will go to hell. So that's uh, another, uh, <clears throat> uh, another, uh, that's, uh, that was, uh, those two words also were other kind of attribution that God gives to Muhammad, but at the same time, the book itself, the Quran, uh, explains itself as uh, the book of guidance, Hidayah in Arabic, and also the book of remembrance, Zikr. 
it reminds you of God. So that's the, you know, that, that's why also Quran calls itself as Zikr or the Book of Remembrance or, uh, and also Guidance. So <clears throat> um, these are very briefly. Uh, um, I was uh, trying to say, uh, I was trying to explain how Quran was revealed to Muhammad, but uh, don't forget it was 23 years from 610 to 623. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 610 again here to 632. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and then a form of the Quran. Um, statistically, um, the Quran includes what in Arabic they call it surah. Let us translate it to chapters. So there is originally 114 chapters in the Quran. Those 114 chapters not are equally divided. Some of them, there are two lines or three lines, and some of them are like 50 pages. So, and then the, you, you may ask, okay, are they divided by, you know, a subject? I, I said, no. Even one chapter may include 50 different subjects. Because as I mentioned to you before that, you know, you have a small chunk coming to Muhammad at a time because of a situation, question, problem, you know, talking about future, whatever. And then all of them, based on the, uh, it appears that in Islamic tradition, based on the guidance of Muhammad and his uh, close uh, companions, they put, you know, all the verses of one chapter in one, like, uh, they made them, them one chapter. So, uh, <clears throat> 114 is the number of chapters. 113 of them, interestingly, start and begin with the same sentence, 114 of uh, 13 of them, okay? And that same sentence is in Arabic as such, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, meaning to say, in the name of God, the most uh, merciful, the most compassionate, a very simple translation. So, trying to introduce God as with those two attributes of uh, Al-Rahman and Al-Rahim, which are uh, merciful and compassionate. So those two, I mean, those 113 times, this sentence repeated in the beginning of uh, apparently one when your mic is on, you probably need to turn it off or I can do it for you. Yeah, okay, that's all. That's fine. Sorry. So 113 of them with this. But what about the last one, 114? Why it doesn't include in the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate? Uh, the point is that the chapter and the verse that doesn't uh, exclude it from having Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in at the beginning is the chapter that is called um, is kind of talking about people with bad deeds and um, but at the same time it doesn't have it doesn't has um, that form of sentence at the beginning, Bismillah, but it has a Bismillah in the middle of chapter. When uh, God 
explains or narrates the story of Solomon. And then God mentions that what Solomon started to write a letter to the king of the other, to the other king, and he starts his letter with the name of God, and Bismillah is mentioned also there. So 114 chapters or surahs with 114 Bismillah in Quran. So kind of introducing God to people with those attribution or with those, yeah, uh, yeah, attributions. Every chapter or every surah is included from smaller parts that are called verses or ayah in Arabic. Ayah means signs. We also call them verses. So imagine the longest uh, chapter has uh, 264, I guess, verses, while the, the smallest one has three verses. I mentioned to you that Quran, with those 114 chapters are not divided like uh, in a, uh, their quantity and quality are not, I'm sorry, their quality are, uh, qu qu their quantity are not the same, but Quran itself as a book, imagine if it is 300 page, is divided to 30 exact uh, parts. In Arabic, they call them juz, but uh, in, so in English, we can say that parts, so those 30 parts, uh, especially those divisions made later on in order to make it easier for Muslims to read Quran. You know, they supposed, in, especially in the months of Ramadan, the, the, the months that they uh, fast, to read each day one part, so in 30 days, they are going to finish the book. But why do you need to read the book? Because I said, the book is sacred. The connection between you as a reader and the book as a sacred makes, you know, brings about the spirituality. So if you are looking for spirituality, then the practice of reciting that book that holy book, as I said, in the Islamic tradition, so makes uh, makes it uh, like a worship, like a worshiping, like a prayer, gives you, connects your inner soul to so people in order to get connection with the divine, with the reality of the world beyond this material world, they were practicing reading Quran. So I mentioned, Quran was uh, divided into 30 parts in order to read each part per day. And then that's the practice. Why? Because it uh, gives you spirituality. People needed to practice spirituality and they saw it as something which gives them uh, that inner, you know, peace or inner meaning or in a whatever sense of connection with the metaphys metaphysical world. Uh, the very first chapter of Quran is called Al-Fatiha. Uh, so in English we can say opening, the opening chapter. And it, it includes seven verses or surah, uh, seven uh, ayahs. And uh, so in every daily prayer, in every daily prayer, every Muslim, that, I mean, whether, I mean, they are from this school or that school or whatever school they are, they should re repeat reading the first chapter every day in every prayer. And I mentioned, it's called Surat Al-Fatiha, so, or the uh, mm, opening, and also it's called Ummul Kitab, the mother of the book, or it's also called Sab'a Masani, the, verse, the chapter which has seven verses, 
and all together, the point is that in this uh, uh, small, I mean, relatively short uh, chapter, uh, Muslim had, I mean, uh, the reader can find out the um, some attribution of God, what's the relationship between you and God, how God needs you to be and how you're supposed to be in front of God, what you need to ask from God. Okay, so for that reason, I am trying, hopefully, to uh, play uh, this short, very short, the citation of that uh, um, verse, uh, that chapter, but maybe less than a minute, and uh, I hopefully I will be able to do so. Uh, if my computer lets me. Yeah. So you will uh, hear the sound uh, of uh, reciting the first chapter of Quran. And it gives you a sense that uh, how much Muslim were uh, dealing with the book of uh, their sacred book, yeah, and then how it was repeated every day, and how they tried to put it in a sort of art, art singing, and you know, they when, when something was important for Muslim, they tried to put it in a in a way that you know, it's like an art, like they approach it as something of aesthetic beauty, something like that. So uh, also uh, in Islamic civilization, you have uh, reciters. Uh, they, they are very, uh, you know, some of them very famous people. And uh, so it's kind of its own uh, uh, version of art. I mean, it's a, a kind of singing, which is a religious singing and uh, was appreciated very much among the Muslims. So here it is. Uh, you will listen to uh, 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 the singing of the first chapter of Quran by uh, someone named called Abdul Basit from Egypt, who was one of the very, very famous uh, Quran reciters of, uh, among the Muslim in recent, uh, like uh, in 20th century. Here you go. So that was the um, chapter, uh, first chapter of Quran, uh, which was a chapter or Surat al fatiha And uh, as I mentioned, reciting Quran is very important among Muslims and in Islamic civilization. And you still have, you still have, I mean, reciters, uh, uh, from Egypt that they are trying to say that we are the best ones and then you have people from uh, Arabia and then you have from every other countries in the Muslim world I mean, even in the US 
you have people that they are trying to say that okay my ability to recite Quran is good and there are always competition no competitions there are you know uh, they gather the best reciters uh, from around the globe uh, they try to do that every year and they just try to say that okay this person was the best one but it's the singing is just not singing it in, one needs to know how to read how to uh, follow the rules the rules uh, there are rules how to pronounce and you know how to sing so it's it's, it's in a way it's a kind of uh, its own version of uh, reading of singing Quran or uh, uh, religious text. This is uh, pretty much in other religions as well. But in Christianity, for instance, in, in Catholicism, you see that you have uh, those uh, musical uh, instruments. Uh, while in um, Islamic uh, tradition, you do not have uh, those, for instance, keyboards, but uh, you just have this kind of singing, uh, especially when dealing with Quran. Uh, but in other instances, you have other, you know, musical instruments. But here, dealing with Quran is just okay, a way of singing, and then following the rules of singing, following the rules of correct singing. Then, then those, uh, you know. Uh, uh, in those competitions, uh, the, f the winner is the one who, first of all, follows the rules and has the best, uh, you know, ability to recite the, the most beautiful way uh, of reciting Quran. Okay, now, uh, Quran, God as well, I said that Muhammad was called as uh, Rasul, Nabi, Messenger, Prophet, whatever. But, and the Quran was called as book of guidance, book of remembrance, book of whatever, even some, sometimes it's called as light, as a light which comes to you, okay? And this is common in religious, you know, culture. On the other hand, God himself called, calls himself uh, sometimes in singular, like an I, you know, but it doesn't repeat too much. In, in Judaism, you know, I don't know if you have heard about it. I am who I am, okay? Uh, the same story when God uh, narrates the same story of himself with Moses. In the Quran, he says that, Tell them that I am God. That's the only I am, I guess. But mo many times God talks about himself in this book and not in singular, but in plural. Like it says, we, we are the one. Or sometimes he, or it is the God who did this or that. But many times as well, we sent you. We did that. We did such and such. So this is the way mostly God and Quran talks about himself. Okay, now uh, the other uh, uh, subject to cover uh, very briefly is uh, the language of Quran, which is uh, in Arabic they call it Fusha. Uh, let's say it's a classic or classical Arabic. So in, uh, in the Islamic countries, you see that Muslim countries are from the Middle East, North Africa, Africa, and East Asia, mainly, I mean, countries with majority of Muslims, but they don't, all, not all of them speaking Arabic language. It's part of Muslim speak Arabic, but there are other Persian, Turks, Urdu, I don't know, Bengali, Bangladesh, you know, Indians, uh, many other, some some China Uyghurs or Turks, or, you know. So, and in the Balkans, like uh, Albanians, uh, some in Bulgaria, they call Pumaks, they can speak Bulgarians, whatever. So, but the majority, there are 
uh, many languages, but uh, let's speak about the language of Quran. So if you go to any country like uh, Syria or Egypt, they do have their own Arabic with their own dialect of Arabic. Uh, I, I'm sure some of you who studied Arabic uh, at RU or somewhere else, you are familiar with those uh, dialects of, especially with Egyptian and uh, Syrians or Levant probably. Um, but uh, Quran, uh, Quranic Arabic is uh, basically called uh, Fusha in Arabic and it's a classical Arabic. And uh, it's also assumed to be the language of the tribe of Muhammad, which was uh, the tribe which was called Quraysh and um, they were living in Mecca, the city which is the most, the sacred city of Muslim, the place that um, when Muslim pray, they face toward that city and in that city toward a small kind of mosque or building which is called Kaaba, which is called House of God. So <clears throat> mostly the language is uh, uh, kind of that tribal language, but uh, at the same time, uh, it uses some rare uh, foreign languages. I'm sorry, foreign words, but those are not too much. Uh, I mentioned last time, uh, like from Persian, it uses, I guess, um, the word for paradise, for those, and uh, um, especially it has some, you know, between Arabic and Hebrew languages, there are some similarities, you know, very simple. Say, Hebrew is the language of Jewish people. So in Hebrew, in, 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 Jude in Hebrew, you say, Shalom Aleichem, but in, in, in Arabic, you say, Salam Alaikum, you know? So, uh, also for instance, Yaum, in Arabic you say Yaum, but in uh, Hebrew you say Yum. So, uh, there are many similarities, but anyway, so uh, Quran borrows some of those words, uh, but uh, usually it has its own language, which is like al uh, al uh, Fusha, or the, la the, 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 the classical Arabic language. Uh, mm, yes, one of the important points about the language of Quran is that Muslims believe that their uh, miracle is not that the prophet were trying to uh, heal ill person or trying to do something that other people can't do. However, there are reports that Muhammad did some of those things. But the point is that for Muslims, is that Quran itself, the book and its language and the way it speaks is the miracle. For that reason, I mean, God as well in the Quran, God says that we revealed the book, we sent the book, and we protect it. And then God speaks about the languages of Quran, which is kind of trying to attribute it as the best language. And at the same time, the, I mean, if someone knows Arabic and reads, especially the chapter, the the jewels, the the. the, the, the the, the last part of the Quran will say uh, he, he sees that the reams and the way the books talks or the Quran talks is a special to its own and uh, so for many reasons Muslims when they or other Muslims when they wanted to study Arabic they were using the Quranic Arabic to teach to teach it in the schools, in the tradition, they used to memorize it. 
and uh, so the language for itself, the, Quran, the language of Quran is important in Islamic, uh, and it is still is one of the uh, when when they call it, uh, what is the miracle of Muhammad as a prophet? The the first the very first thing which is said among the Muslim is that it's his book Quran. And then uh, I think that I discussed uh, uh, about the content of the Quran. I mean, I, I, earlier I mentioned God, human creation. Hereafter, many other this content, this topics are uh, covered in the Quran. But one of the things that maybe I, I would like to mention here at this time is that Quran as well talks about this world at and end of the time. I mean, there are certain um, uh, certain. Uh, Verses very briefly talking about that at the end, you know, those who were suppressed, they will gain the power. Okay, so the matter of justice that's the matter of justice. Quran talks about this issue, as you know, that uh, other religions as well they talk about the justice at the end of the time. So, um, uh, in Islamic culture, uh, uh, unlike the like Judaism or Christianity, Messiah, Messiah, or Masih, or in Islamic culture, Mahdi, the one who comes at the end of the time and uh, in order to establish justice in the world and help those poor and uh, oppressed people. Uh, and then you have hereafter. But uh, this is another common issue among many religions, which the Quran as well talks about it. And it, uh, yeah, it, it, it is not Muhammad who returns in this, in the case of Islam. I'm like in Christianity, you have Jesus, sometimes we believe that Jesus comes back. But uh, in Islamic thought, it is Mahdi, the, the one who guides, comes back. And then, between that Mahdi in Islamic tradition, later tradition, and the say in the saying of Prophet of Islam, between this interconnection or between this connection between uh, that Mahdi and Jesus. Uh, so uh, and that's also is another common uh, ideas and in Quran with uh, other religions. Uh, doctrines of Quran, doctrine of Quran as, as a book of, uh, you know, as a revealed book, as a book of uh, a religion, as a sacred book. So it comes with doctrine, the, the very main, the topic. And then maybe it's at the same time, the very main important talk, important point of the Quran, but at the same time, so sort of, it could be, we can, we can call it uh, the difference between Quran and uh, the Bible, for instance, or Quran, Islam and Christianity, let's say, is that Quran calls, calls you and uh, asks you to worship the one God, which is called Allah. Okay. Now, uh, Quran talks about Christianity, talks about Christians in a positive way, but also uh, criticizes the idea of Trinity as well. So in the Quranic sense, God is one and only one, and it has no parts because in, uh, in that a set of mind having something believing that something or coming with parts means that every part may need the other part and then that uh, provides the assumption that God is in need so God this part of God needs that part of God uh, whether uh, we take it literally or symbolically in Christianity with that idea, that idea 
has been philosophically argued against in the Quran. Why? Jesus is approved as prophet and Christianity and Christians were approved as people of the book. Oh, you should also know that. The idea of the people of the book in Quran refers especially, especially to Christians and Jews. So also Muslim. So those who believe in to in in the in in a in a the in the divine revealed books, like Christian and Jews and other religions that I will discuss later, are called as people of the book, and they are the people that who are saved or uh, find if they are true in their belief and if they act upon based on the guidance Quran says that they are saved and guided uh, so the, the, this very notion of one God as called in the Quran as Tawheed. So if, if you ask a Muslim, what is the most important message of Quran? So the answer is Tawheed, calling to worship only one God and not thinking or believing in anyone or anything assisting that God. So that one in itself is perfect in a way that it doesn't need anything else. So that uh, makes the idea of Tawheed. And when Muhammad was uh, asking people or talking to people or trying to uh, uh, inform them about the message of Quran was telling him was telling them say that there is no God but God and then you will be saved and you know uh, yeah you will be saved so uh, the idea of monotheism in a way that God is one God doesn't need anything or anyone else perfect in itself and absolute perfectness is in that one okay and then so the this is the one the second doctrine is that muhammad is his last prophet so the lastness okay he's the seal of prophecy but prophet no other prophet is coming after him why if he is the last but the point is that there are prophets before Muhammad, from Adam to him. Quran accept those prophets and says to all who follow the, uh, that religion that accepting Islam as a religion or accepting Quran as a book of God should be included in accepting and face in all other prophets prior to Muhammad. So it means Jesus, Moses, uh, up to other because all of them are prophets of prophets of God and then <clears throat> so having God as one God and Muhammad as the last prophet then so okay it brings you on uh, the um, um, the way of life and introduces you a way of life okay if you wanted to you know, if you want a salvation, then do this and do, don't do that. These are the things to be righteousness and then avoid injustice. And then I, I mentioned that justice also as, uh, as, 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 as at the end of the time also that the idea of the common between uh, Islam and other religion. So justice is also is very important in Quran in different parts and God as well himself was uh, are called as a just God. Okay, <clears throat> and then the, the other most one of the important things about the Quran and doctrines is the day of resurrection. Uh, in Arabic, it's called it is called 
Yawmul uh, Hisab. So the, 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 the day of resurrection and the day that people face with their, what they did and then face and encounter the other life after this. And then, uh, you know, punishment, paradise, hell, and things like that, which, uh, you know, I, I briefly mentioned early. And then there are many discussions in Islamic civilization that, okay, how that, uh, you know, next life would look like. Well, you have your body, your physical body there. Quran, you know, uh, talks about the resurrection of your body from your uh, graves. And then also you will understand that, okay, the, the other world is the world of uh, spiritual realm, the world of uh, metaphysics and invisible. And then there's a contradiction. And, and many people try to solve this too, but it was one of the very difficult questions of how to solve the bodily, corporeal bodily uh, resurrection with the idea that the other world is world of uh, uh, spiritual realities and kind of things that are not same as uh, what we have here. Okay. Um, uh, very briefly about the collection of the text of Quran, as mentioned, that Quran revealed to Muhammad in 22 years. But uh, uh, if you studied like uh, the uh, ancient civilizations, you can see that the many, many of those, uh, many of those civilizations had their own texts that were transmitted orally between generations and people to people orally. So uh, as well, Quran at the beginning, Muhammad was receiving the text and you know uh, repeating it to these companions. And among the companions, there were a group of people who were uh, you know memorizing Quran and then narrating to the others. So yes, Muhammad um, they memorized. They but finally, it's uh, Quran. Um, recorded uh, by uh, secretaries as well. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, into it was collected to surahs, it was collected to uh, chapters, and it was uh, finally after the death of Muhammad, according to, the, according to Master, it was after the final the death of Muhammad uh, that Master had it like, a book between two covers, okay. Uh, but at the same time, uh, in, in Western scholarships, there was doubt that, oh, no, Quran was not collected in the early Islam, but it was collected like centuries later. Um, I, 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 uh, and then uh, some recent scholarships, uh, they were uh, studied some uh, very, very old manuscripts and dated it back to the early period of Islam. So it seems that uh, the Quran was collected early after Muhammad's death. Okay. <laughs> so as I mentioned, so that the collection of Quran I need it because you know it was oral, and then you need to make that oral in written, in written form. But you need to have you know those alphabets. You need to improve alphabet to distinguish letter. You know, uh, so all those things happened uh, right after the, they tried to put Quran as a text, and then uh, that making. I mean, I, it seems that. That making orally transmitted uh, concepts into written form, it starts kind of uh, probably bringing together science of kind of linguistics and science of writing, science of, I mean, how to uh, pronounce things. And 
it also uh, as a text Quran invite, invited people to follow and go look for search for knowledge and especially there is this, uh, there, there was a tradition from Muhammad asking people uh, uh, go for knowledge and look for knowledge even if you have to travel to China I mean uh, in Arabic so means that go go look for science for knowledge even if I mean that day that, those days even if you have to go to China and you know that we know that uh, China uh, also had the tradition of Confucianism and those Confucianism are coming from I mean that those are including many metaphysical and cosmological discussions and in Chinese tradition prophet is called as sage in Arabic Hakim so uh, yeah anyway so uh, Muhammad calls uh, ask people to do that travel I mean imagine those days it was a far away but uh, this uh, Quran and the uh, saying uh, it appears that Quran uh, was a beginning of um, of making the civilization of making the civilization which was covered and a very vast area which was uh, like from the eastern side from India and like further than India up to the Portugal, you know, North Spain, you know, that area, you know, you see that it's a quite huge uh, area, which is, you know, and nowadays you have uh, some leftovers from Islamic civilization in Spain. You know, if you read uh, the history of Spain, you see that, uh, uh, Muslim Christian and Jews they had uh, 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 collaboration in science in Spain and, and that's uh, one point that uh, uh, some historians of science mentioned that the uh, Islamic civilization moved into Europe through Spain okay Muslim were ruling Spain for about 500 years it is, you know, Spain is North Africa, you know, from Spain to North Africa, uh, North Africa to Spain. So it has a, a very long, huge discussion in the, you know, history that is discussed among the uh, historians and those who also are uh, very interested in the uh, transmission of knowledge from uh, Islamic uh, uh, civilization into Europeans. <clears throat> Yeah, there are disagreements about the text, but we are not going to cover it now because we don't have time. And Quran, yes, in as I mentioned, I guess you understood that uh, Quran was used in uh, Islamic tradition and civilization, and it's uh, involved. The Muslims' daily life was involved by Quran. Um, plus, Muslim had to interpret Quran for this reason. They made a lot of Quranic co commentaries to Quran, and uh, uh, we will discuss this. We don't have time for this, but it's one of the most important issues that uh, um, uh, happen in Islamic tradition. You will have many, many, many different interpretation and commentaries on Quran and it repeats every century, every 50 years, every 25 years and nowadays every five years. Okay, so I guess if I'm not wrong, it's like the time that we may say it's the end of our class. But as mentioned, 